Development Summit. I am the first presenter, Brendan Rerick. Welcome. Uh, today, we will be discussing money. Now, no one needs to run. Money, money is what makes the world go around. And if we don't make money, we're not going to be able to do this profession for very long. Now, I've recently written a book called Coaching Rules. It's a how-to book or how-to manual for a successful career in strength and fitness. So tomorrow, I'll actually be talking about rule number four here, serving others or what you want your legacy to be. Uh, but today, I want to talk about money and rules for money and how to a how-to presentation for a financially successful career in strength and fitness. And this is one of the biggest topics I get asked about a lot during mostly mentorship calls that I have with people who want to discuss business. And it seems that in the fitness industry, that money is a taboo thing to talk about. And I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because we're not <laughs> uh, incredibly high earners like they are on Wall Street or doctors. Um, but people seem to be afraid to share what it is they make, how they make it, what they charge. Uh, and I want to kind of help break down those barriers. So this is the first time I'm ever doing this talk. I've talked a lot about money with individuals. Uh, you might also find me a little bit crazy after we go through this. I presented this to five people earlier in the week. Uh, they loved it, but they also told me that I'm out of my mind. So you can tell me that I'm okay with that. Uh, and But let's have some fun here. I did put in the chat box, a link to the spreadsheet that I'll be discussing today. You don't have to have it open. You can have it there for review. That is for you after this talk. I've done all the calculations in the spreadsheet for you and all the formulas. So all you have to do is plug in uh, what you paid for each category and it'll spit out all the numbers. All right. This is the presentation I wish I had heard when I started adulting 12 years ago. Because unfortunately, the high school and college education curriculums do not have any sort of financial, I can, I can do calculus, I can find X, I can tell you the angle of that triangle. But when I got out of college, I didn't know how to write a check. I didn't know what a 401k was. No one knows how to balance a checkbook anymore. Um, so this is the presentation I wish I'd heard when I started adulting 12 years ago. This is a play on coaching rules, my book. I've done a couple presentations and it's in the book. The book starts out, this is the book I wish I had read when I started coaching 12 years ago. Uh, because when you retire, and I'm assuming that if you're on this call with me, listening to me talk about this, or you're, you've registered for this event this weekend, you may plan on doing this to retirement, which is incredible because 20 years ago, this was not, strength and conditioning was not a job. Personal training was not a job you could retire from. And my plan is to retire in 2000. 56. That's my retirement year. That's when I'll be 65. And that would be 46 years in the training business of training people. So when I retire, I want to know, and you probably want to know that you helped a lot of people, that you have your family and your health still intact, that you have money in the bank because you can't retire if you don't got any money in the bank and that you did it the right way. So these are the four most important things for me when I want to retire and from what I've heard from other people when they want to retire or from people who are currently retired. And today we're talking about money because if you don't have money in the bank, you can't retire. And money equals freedom. We need to change the narrative around money because when people think money, they immediately think evil. And that if I want more money or if I collect too much money, then I must be an evil person. It is not true. Money does two things, or one thing. It grants you more freedom. Now, everybody's freedom looks different. Uh, the cost of everybody's freedom is different as well. 
it's a tool. Money is a tool, just like you would use a tool in the gym, right? The kettlebell is a tool, the dumbbell is a tool, the barbell is a tool. Money is a tool to do things you want to do and create freedom for yourself and your family. So if we change the narrative that money is not evil, it is a tool, and it allows you to do the things you want to do. Because if you are not collecting a paycheck, then you're not going to be able to be a trainer for very long and help a lot of people. So in a research study from Northwestern Mutual, they found that 22% of adults in the U.S. have less than $5,000 saved for retirement. And 46% of people expect to work past the age of 65. Now, I don't know about you, but I do not want to wake up for clients at 5 a.m., or groups at 5 a.m. And I don't want to stay late at the gym training afternoon clients at 6, 7, 8 p.m. when I'm 50 years old. That is not my goal. Now, I don't mind training people for the rest of my life, but I don't want to do it probably full time when I'm in my 50s. And I don't want to be getting up at for 4 a.m. And I don't want to be staying until 9 p.m. I'm fine to do that in my 20s to get my career rolling and get busy. But that's that's not sustainable for 50 years. This is the spreadsheet that I've shared with you in the chat box. Now, if you have any questions or you want me to elaborate on anything at any time, all you have to do is put it either in the chat box or the Q&A box. I can see both of them. I can navigate both of them. I'm very comfortable on Zoom webinar now after the last year of COVID. So if you have any questions or you want me to elaborate or dive into something deeper, we have really two hours. I won't go two hours. I'm, I'm going to try to keep this to one hour, but I'm happy to do that. This is the spreadsheet. If you came in after, it might not be there. Yes. So if you came in a little bit after I started, here is the link. I just put it in the chat box again. Again, you don't have to follow this the whole time. You are welcome, Anoush. The money rules training program, just like you have a training program, which is essentially a journal for your clients, you are going to have a training program and a journal for your money. Because the first thing you need to know is where you are currently at. It's just like when we ask our clients when we're doing nutrition and we tell them, hey, you need to fill out a food journal for three or four days because I, we we need to be more aware of where you're at, what you're currently eating, what it might be, right? So this is what we need to do with our money. And I'm gonna take you through that right now. Now, the uh, context for all of the following calculations, in my opinion, if I wanna put my money where my mouth is, yes, that is pun is intended, I better show you some numbers. And I'm gonna use my own personal numbers. I have no qualms about this. I am completely transparent. I have no, I have nothing to hide at all. If you wanna know what I make, what I charge, it's all coming right now. Context for all the following calculations. So I'm gonna show you how I fill out this spreadsheet. My location is the Bay Area, in California. Yes, very expensive other than maybe New York City which is probably equal to what we, we pay here. We have two earners in our family. So I have my wife, we file taxes jointly. My wife is a public speaking coach. She does some training on the side, but most, the majority of her income is from public speaking. She's an executive public speaking coach. Myself, I am a strength coach and I have my hands in a lot of different cookie jars. Our assets, the only asset we have that is worth anything is our, our house. And we bought our house 1.5 years ago, about an hour outside of San Francisco because we couldn't afford anything in the Bay Area. So we had to move an hour and 15 east in order to pay about half of what a house costs in the Bay. So I do own my house now. I was renting for the first 10 years. And my only debt, my only debt, well, including our mortgage, sorry, I consider that an asset, but so an asset would be considered good debt, whatever that means, good debt, because you can 
essentially make money off of that asset or sell it again and get your money back. A car is not good debt because the second you drive it off the lot, it is now worth about half of what it was and it depreciates each year. Whereas a house doesn't necessarily depreciate, it actually, well, it's dependent on the market. So debt, monthly car payment, and then literally this week on Monday, I paid off my solar loan payment. So we got solar on the house because we're in California and getting solar on our house was actually cheaper than paying for electricity. So our electricity bill is 305 a month and we got solar panels on our house to cover that $305 utility payment per month. And we put on solar and our payment was only $200 a month. So it was actually $100 cheaper to get solar in Cal. So this is California, remember. California has the best rebates, blah, 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 blah. That might not be the same in your state. Okay, so this is the context of all these numbers that are about to follow. Now, we need to know what your cost of monthly living is. Number one, we, if we don't know what our expenses are, we have no idea how much money we need to make in order to live our current lifestyle. So this is my house slash apartment. And that, this is for the year 2021. Now I'm so crazy that I actually have all of these numbers all the way back to 2014. So the spreadsheet I gave you, I've been keeping for the last seven years. I track every single dollar I spend because it's the only way you can know where your money is going. Also, when you're cognitive or aware of where your money is going, you are <laughs> much more likely to make different decisions. They've shown that when you do a food journal, that you actually eat 350 to 500 less calories per day by just tracking your food because you're more aware of it. And I'm gonna tell you right now from experience that if you track your money, you spend a, a lot less than you would if you weren't tracking it all and just charging it all on credit cards. My rent or mortgage payment every month is 1183. The taxes in California on that house or on this house that I'm in right now is $521 a month. So I know a lot of these numbers are chopped in the 12s because my tax payment for the house comes every year, but it's about $6,000. So then I divide it by 12 and I get 521 a month. The insurance on this house is $70 a month. Our electric bill. So this is the solar payment plus solar doesn't cover natural gas. So our natural gas payment is about $60 a month dispersed about throughout the year. It's higher in the colder months. $264 is what we average per month. So it's the solar payment plus the uh, natural gas payment to heat water. Our water payment, so we have to pay for water here in my town, it's $90 a month. So if you water your lawn or you have a pool, we have a pool, it costs you about almost $100 a month. And then our trash pickup, is $44 a month. Uh, I put other here just in case you have other payments that you have to make like an HOA. Uh, if you have a, a security system you have to pay for every month, that would go here. So our my cost of monthly living for my wife and I, remember there's two earners in our house, two people, is $2,172 a month. That's just for the house. Okay, so I know that. Okay, now car. Uh, my wife's car is paid off, but our other car is brand new and we want to pay it off in five years. So that's $831 a month for that car. Gas. The new car is electric. My wife's car has gas. In the pandemic, and now that we're working from home, we don't travel very much. So we only pay about $60 in gas per month. It used to be God, between the two of us used to be three to $400 a month before pandemic. But that's one of the reasons why I bought an electric car is because gas was costing me so much money and the solar pays for the car, electric. 
gas, we only pay about $60 a month. Maintenance on those cars dispersed throughout the year. The new car needs no maintenance. It's electric, so there's no oil changes. There's none of that. Uh, maintenance on her car is about $75 a month dispersed about the year. She had to buy new tires. That was $500. So I dispersed that over 12 months. The insurance on both of those cars is $273 a month for the two of us. The taxes and registration. So my, the new car registration was $850 and her car's registration was $350. So that's $1,200. It's $100 a month. We don't have any extra costs on our cars. So the car, just to have a car, just to have two cars, is thirteen thirty nine a month. Okay, essentials. We have three people. I, I have a six year old daughter. Essentials. So our food bill is about thirteen thousand dollars a year. And I know this because I've been tracking this for the last seven years, and it averages out to about twelve fifty. The least I've ever spent was when I was living alone, which was around 9,000. But then living with three people is the average goes up to about 12 or 13. Yes, I eat a lot. <laughs> health insurance. So thankfully, my wife's company gives her full health insurance coverage. I also work for a healthcare company that I consult for, and I have to pay $160 a month as a part time employee to be under their healthcare coverage. So we're very, very lucky and grateful to have that low of a payment. We know that not everybody does. So between essentials, which I consider basically food and health insurance, you might have more essentials than us, is $1,180 per month. Uh, then we have memberships. We don't have a lot of memberships. As you can see, I am very anal about money and I do not spend any money on any subscriptions that I don't need or use specifically. So memberships, our only music membership is Spotify, which is $15 a month. The only app memberships we have is we both have, uh, she has a Zoom account she has to pay for, for the, uh, the extra time that they allot you and to have more participants. And Netflix, that's the only web streaming service we use is Netflix. Nothing else we pay for subscriptions, uh, master's class. Oh, and I actually forgot to put phone here. So phone, my phone is $85 a month and our internet is $35 a month. And then her phone is, pro no, her, her business company pays for her phone. So I should actually be adding about 160 maybe even 200 a month here. So I apologize. See, this is why you keep track and keep record of it because you won't always remember everything. Okay, so this should really be 200, but we'll use these numbers. I'm gonna have to fix this when we're done. Your cost of monthly living, fun. Fun is a, is a miscellaneous category, really. I put travel, hobbies, and entertainment. I have no hobbies at all other than saving my pennies and doing strength and conditioning stuff. You can see I'm quite boring. My wife's hobby is jujitsu. So she pays $130 a month for a jujitsu membership. She loves doing that. Travel. We average because uh, she's from Chicago and I'm from Boston and we go back to both of those places multiple times per year. We like to go travel the world at least and try to get somewhere once or twice a year. It costs, we spend about $12,000 a year in travel. Now, last year, that number was maybe a thousand because we went to Boston once due to COVID. But this year, when everything starts opening up, so I'm making assumptions here, but over the last seven years, the average has been $12,000 a year in travel for us. That's, that's what, that's my hobby. That's what I spend my money on. And then entertainment. What's entertainment? That's taking my daughter to the movies. That's going out for dinners. That's, uh, again, COVID shot some of that down last year, but th the average over the last seven years for me has been around $3,000, $3,600, So it's about $250 a month there. 
So fun, whatever you want to put in that category for us is about 12, 13 a month. And then finally miscellaneous. So the only extra payment I have is I have a child support payment. I have to pay my daughter's mother $550 a month, no matter what. So I don't have pet insurance. I don't have school loans. Uh, I don't have any other random things. So the only thing I missed here was I did miss my phone and internet, which should be about $200 more per month to this next number here. So house and apartment is 2000. Car is about 1300. Essentials is about 1100. Membership should be about 200. Fun is about 1000. Other is about 600 or 550 a month. I don't know where that nine came from. That should be a zero. It should be 550 a month. So $6,500 roughly. Now, I always add a 10% buffer for the reason that you may be forgetting things uh, or something might happen that you don't have control over. So I always add a 10% buffer to my expenses just to cover those, those things. So the final number, if I add a 10% buffer, is between two of us. In order to live our current lifestyle, we need to make $7,175 a month just to live our current lifestyle right now. I'm going to take a sip of coffee. It's 630 or 6.20 here, I think. Yeah, 6.27 a.m. on a Saturday. Okay, how much do you need to work in order to support your current lifestyle? Okay. Monthly expenses times 12 months. That means that at a, we need to make $86,100 between two of us, not one of us. Between two of us, we need to make $86,100. Oh, but what did we forget? We got to pay taxes. Yay. So $86,100. The federal tax for that number is 22% plus state tax in California, my state tax, our state tax is 9.3%. You can look all this up, find out what tax bracket you're in. I think if you make under $55,000 a year, you only pay 12% in federal tax. But if you're over $170,000 a year, you pay 28% or maybe 32% in taxes. And then everyone's state tax is different. For example, Nevada and Florida don't have income tax. But most other states do. California is the highest. So that means I pay 31.3% of my money to the government. That's $25,666 per year. That means in order to make or bring home $86,100 in order to live our lifestyle, we need to make together $113,000 just to live our current lifestyle, not the lifestyle we want to live, the current lifestyle that we are actually living at the moment. My wife and I together need to make over this amount. Okay, so now being aware of this is very, very helpful to know how much we need to work what we need to do, where we might want to save. Do we need to change jobs? Do I need to pick up an extra job? Are we living above our means? Do I need to sell my car? Do we need to downsize our house? Or can we upgrade our house? I don't know until I do all of these numbers. Now, that is what your spreadsheet is here. We'll talk more about how to how much do I need to work in order to support my current lifestyle. That's coming. Okay, so now we know how much, I know how much my life costs. This is something that you're going to have to do on your own using that spreadsheet. And you might not be able to do this until you have a year's worth of data. You can guesstimate though. Guesstimating is a good place to start. And then you start actually taking these numbers and putting them in. I'll show you how to do that on the spreadsheet at the end here. Okay, I've, I've been in, I've read books too many books about finances. I've done finance courses or personal, sorry, I should say personal finance, not business finance, not uh, st 
stocks and trading and all that. I'm talking about personal finance. The, there's a huge problem with thinking about the perfect day, right? My perfect day is laying on the beach, literally not doing anything but drinking pina coladas until I fall asleep. And then I wake up and I eat a gigantic hamburger and then I do it all again in the afternoon and then I maybe go in the water a few times and I fall back asleep on the beach and then I have a crazy big dinner, steak dinner, and then go to bed, right? That's my perfect day. The perfect day is a horrible way to live a long, healthy life and it's a horrible way to judge what your expenses should be or what you want out of your life. So the perfect day, we're going to throw this out the window. What is a sustainable week for you for the upcoming year? <clears throat> That's what we want to judge our expenses against. So what does your week look like in a sustainable week for the upcoming year? Where do you live? When do you wake up? How many times do we're trainers here? So how many times do you work out per day? When do you work out? What activities or hobbies do you participate in? What weekly responsibilities do you have? So I did this for myself, okay? My week looks like, right now I work about six hours a day, six days a week. So I have a 36 hour week between in-person clients and online clients meetings and admin. And it's about half and half. So I'd say, yeah, half, 18 clients a week with 18 hours of, or in person, and then 18 hours of meetings and admin work on the computer or doing webinars like this. Where do I live right now? I live in Brentwood, California. <clears throat> when do I wake up? I'm not a, there's some people that their whole thing is I don't want to wake up without an alarm. I don't mind. I mean, I was up at 420 today, so uh, I don't mind getting up early. Monday through Friday, whenever my first client or meeting is, I'll get up. It's, it's not a huge deal to me. That So again, <clears throat> money equals freedom. That's one of those freedom things that is not important to me. It might be to you to not wake up on the alarm. Saturdays, I don't take anyone before 8 a.m. And then Sundays, I take off completely. So that's probably my biggest change since my 20s is that I used to work all weekends, all day Saturday, all day Sunday. And I would get up whenever anyone, I had no boundaries. How many times do you work out? I try to work out 30 minutes a day. I'd say I get there about 80% of the time. So that's my goal, 30 minutes a day. I try to do it in the morning. That's the best for me. If it's in after 2 p.m. in the afternoon, it ain't happening. <clears throat> what activities do you, hobbies do you participate in? Luckily, uh, as you can see, money matters a lot to me and paying down my debts. Uh, I don't have a lot of hobbies that cost me anything. Walking daily, reading and hiking don't cost anything, except the books, maybe. What weekly responsibilities do you have? The only mandatory responsibility that I have weekly is I have to pick up or exchange my daughter every Monday and Thursday with her mother. It's about an hour drive there, hour drive home. So it's a two hour drive. That's my main responsibility for the week. Everything else is done in house, I guess, at home. And then starting in April, I'll be traveling once a month for certified functional strength coach or to speak. So those are those are really my weekly responsibilities. And I don't I don't want any more than that. I'm cool with that. So that's what my sustainable week for the upcoming year looks like. Now we have what is your perfect vision board month? I think most people have heard of a vision board where you're you make a collage, you like cut stuff out of magazines or print them off from Google and you put it up on a poster board of what you want your perfect life to look like. And then you look at it 10 years from now and you see how close you are. So really, I want to know what your perfect vision board month or week looks like, not your day. Remember, your day is going to be sitting on a beach drinking pina colada somewhere. I want to know what your perfect vision board month like something that's sustainable or weak would look like. So what does your work week look like? Where do you live? When do you wake up? Same question. But now we have a vision of what I want in the future, right? So we have our current state. You need to know where you're at currently. Must know what your expenses are currently and what your current job, career, 
lifestyle situation is now to make sure that your expenses and your income match up. Because remember, I got to make, between my wife and I, we have to make $113,000 a year in order to live our current lifestyle. Now we can either cut some things out by spend less or we have to make more or and making more includes working more. Our vision board, what's my vision board month? That I work eight hours a day. So actually I would prefer to work more hours per day, but do it in less days. Cause right now I'm six and six. I'd rather be eight and four and have a three day weekend. Doing the same thing. I love what I do. I don't want to change what I do. I just want to have more boundaries on the hours in which I do them. Where do you live? Not in California. To be honest, we're here because my six-year-old is here. Um, from there, we'll see see what happens. But in my vision board, we're not living here. When do you wake up? Again, waking up to me, it's the same. So actually, I'm I'm living my vision board right now as I just wake up whenever my first client or meeting is. Uh, but I would have Fridays through Sundays off. I wouldn't work Friday through Sunday in my vision board week. I'd work out the same. Uh, I wouldn't change that. My hobbies, I would like to do something that's a little more physical, like, I don't know, build something or carpentry or I don't know, something a little more physical than just walk and read. Uh, or have have an actual hobby because I don't. And then what responsibilities do you have? I would like my only responsibility to be to travel or coach or teach only when I feel like it. Right now I'm doing monthly because I need to hit that one hundred and thirteen thousand dollars. If I if I don't travel monthly, I won't hit that number. I would like to probably only travel six to eight times a year to places I only want to go. So we have my vision board week. Now this, this, these calculations are really difficult to do now. This is where you're gonna have to take some of the lead. So I'm giving you as much as I can, but some of this is gonna have to be on you to do these numbers. You can also, so we talked about how much do I need to work? So you can do this for how much do I need to work for my sustainable current state? And then how much do I need to work for my perfect vision board week? These are the numbers you need to have in order to calculate this. So our total expenses per month, we've done that. I showed you that earlier. So our total expenses per month. Now I did this just for me, Brendan. I'm gonna take my wife out of it and I'm gonna split it in two. So I know what I need to do in order to hit this. The $113,000 number, which is what 60, no, 50, 52, no, 113, $56,000 a year. I take home. Remember, there's taxes. So that means if we take that 7175 number and divide it by two, that means I need to make $3,587 per month, but there's taxes. So that means 31% needed to add to those expenses. So $1,122. So that is, oh, I didn't write it down here. I thought I did. So that would be 4,000, um, 4,700 about. So I need to make 4,700 a month minimum in order to hit those numbers. So if I'm talking about my vision board week, <clears throat> if I'm only working, four days a week, and there's four weeks in a month, that means there's only 16 days that I have to make $4,700, okay? So 587 plus 1122 divided by those 16 days, that means I need to make $300 per working day. I'm not counting the days I don't work, right? I work in order to have those three free days. Now, again, you could do this with your current state as well. So my current state is six times six, or sorry, six days. Yeah, six days a week times four, because there's four weeks in a month. Six times four is 24. So if I disperse $4,700 over 24 days, I need to make less per day. So I don't need to work as much. 
Now, okay, so if I kneel, I need $300 a day. And I charge $80 per client on average. Some people more, some people less. That's my take home per client. If yours is less, you'll need to take more clients on. If yours is more, you'll need to take less clients on. That means I need to train or charge four clients a day four days a week in order to hit my number. Now, remember, if my wife made less than me or didn't work, or if I didn't work and my wife did, I would need to, one of us would be needing to hit that $7,175 number. Or actually, I take that back. You would add taxes to that. So you'd need to be hitting around 10000 dollars a month if you're the only earner in the house this is just i'm using nice clean numbers here none of this is clean i'm using clean numbers to teach but nothing nothing about this is clean also remember my numbers are off because i forgot cell phone and internet so yeah now i know oh well i better be averaging four clients a day four days a week in order to hit my numbers that means if you're doing free work that ain't gonna cut it <laughs> I'm the four paid clients at $80 per hour. If you make $40, if you charge $40 an hour on average, that means you're going to have to train about seven clients four days a week in order to hit your vision board week or hit your current status. So that's how we find out how much we need to work. That's how much we find out what we're actually spending and what our life costs us. And unfortunately, none of us were ever, ever taught this. So I'm teaching it right now in my own little master's class. <clears throat> okay, quick money rules, since it is the title of the presentation. Have a rainy day fund, which is a minimum of three months expenses. I think everybody might have learned this during COVID. That means I need to have in the bank at all times that is accessible $21,525 based off of my monthly expenses. So I always keep around 20 grand in the bank in order to have that rainy day. If something happens, you might have to shell it out. I've had health problems in the past. My deductibles were, at the time was $9,500. I had to sh shell out nine $9,500 when I got sick. So it, it happens. Calories in, calories out. I use this analogy because we're all familiar with it. Calories in, calories out. That's how you lose weight. You can either eat less or you can burn more calories with activity. Or money in, money out. You can either spend less money, but you need to know how much you're spending. That's where the spreadsheet comes in. Or you can make more money and spend the same amount. Those are your only two options. Money in, money out. Calories in, calories out. Now, the quality, the quantity, that's all debatable. But in the end, it comes down to simple numbers, in and out, garbage in, garbage out. So one of the best ways to spend less money is to become aware of what you're spending. Think of food journaling. You need a money journal. That's what I'm providing you today. This is why if you pay things with cash, it used to be there was no credit cards. If you paid things with cash, you are much more likely to think about the decision you're about to make. Because when you swipe a credit card, you don't see that transaction. You don't physically watch the $100 bills declining in front of you. Ask yourself, do I really need this or is this something that I just want? That's the only question you have to ask yourself. Every time you're going to make a purchase, you say, well, do I really need this or is this just something I want? Now, if it's something you really, really want and you've been working towards, I totally get it. There's things I spend money on that I want that I've actively decided upon, but it's always an active decision. I always ask myself, do I really need this first or do I really want this? And then use compounding interest to your advantage. I had no idea what compounding interest was until probably five years ago when I started studying all this stuff. Also, in the book, Coaching Rules, 
which seems a little awkward is I have a couple rules that involve compounding interest. You're like a coaching rules book. How does coaching people have anything to do with compounding interest or 401ks or retirement? Well, it does if you want to do this for the next 35 years and you want to retire doing this. That's my whole goal is I, I am a whole, I, I'm assuming that if you're on this call, you are probably a career trainer or you have a career and you want to retire from it and you don't want to work until you're 90. Compounding interest. This is the easiest way I can explain it. We're going to use $10,000 as our number. $10,000 tax-free dollars. So if you're putting, you're taking $10,000 out of your paycheck every week and you're putting it in a tax-free investment. And we're going to use 7% as the average. That's the average return of most of the years over the last hundred years, that's the average return of the stock market. So that means after one year, you'll have $1,070. Actually, that is incorrect. Wow, I really messed up that number. It should be one, it should be $10,700. See, now I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna do these numbers again for y'all. So $10,000 taxed at 31.3%, I just used my numbers, after one year is $687. So the difference between tax-free and a tax dollar, actually, I'm going to go in here. I'm going to do this right now because I can. So you can all see this live. $10,700 taxed is going to be 6,000. You know what happened was that I actually had this be $1,000 and then the numbers weren't big enough to see the differences and I changed it to 10,000 and I forgot to add the zeros. So boo on my part. Still, Brendan, see this is math. Woo. All right, so if I was using Oh, I do have, so I do have these bottom numbers correct. I just didn't have the top numbers correct. Okay, so $10,000 tax free dollars invested in a, four, we'll say 401k account, and it gets 7% average. After one year, you'll have $10,700. $10,000 tax dollars after one year, at the end of the year, because it's been taxed, you'll have $6,870. Okay. Now you have, I'm not going to get into the difference between tax free or what they call a Roth IRA and a uh, simple or a, a, what do they call it? It's not a Roth, uh, I, uh, IRA or a 401k that is tax free. This is where you need to study and have an accountant. I'm showing the basics here. Compound each of these dollars in an investment account over five years. So five years, 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years. Now, I'm going to go to my spreadsheet. I'm going to go Google Docs. So I did all these compounding interest numbers in a Google Doc. I want to make sure I give you the right numbers because if I don't give you the right numbers, this ain't going to be any good or make any sense. <clears throat> I should have had somebody check my work. Rule number one as a presenter. Okay, recent. Here we go. I'll show everybody how to go through the spreadsheet. As soon as I'm done here, this is my final thing. Okay, so I did use the correct numbers when I did here. So $10,000, so this is gonna be tax free, tax, and then this number over here is what would happen to your money if you just left it in your bank account. 
where there's no compounding interest in your bank account. So I did use the correct numbers. Okay, so over 30 years, if you put that $10,700 in a tax-free investment, over 30 years, that $10,000 is now worth $76,000 without you doing anything. You did nothing. You just left it in the account for 30 years. And you can see how it builds each year. Now, you take a tax free, you put it in a Roth IRA or a taxed investment. It's going to cost you 50, or not cost you, it'll bring you in $52,000. So the difference is about $20,000. And if you make this number bigger or make this longer, the numbers start to really split. If you leave $6,870 in a bank account, this is what it's worth after 30 years, if it just sits there. $7,978, because you get about a half a percent of interest on your dollar when it sits in a bank account. Okay, so think about that. Same amount of money. It's doing the same thing. It's just sitting in your bank account. You could make, turn $6,000 into $52,000, or you could take $10,000 and make it into $76,000. And if you add zeros to all of these, those are some big numbers. Okay, that's compounding interest. Where to learn more about this stuff? I've glossed over the basics. Really, my, my biggest point here, or my priority for you, is to just start journaling and keeping track of everything. Where to learn more? The Richest Man in Babylon, is a, it's written in story form, so it's the most fun. It's the easiest to read. If you want the easiest thing to read, that's a fun lesson, start there. It's a bunch of different uh, rules mixed into a story. The millionaire, millionaire Next Door is the most motivating. The whole book is up on the premise of we, those who don't have high income earnings, like we're talking hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars, how you can build wealth over time. It's the most motivating book out there. It's The Millionaire Next Door. Personal Finance, this was my favorite one to learn the lingo. Like what the difference between a Roth IRA, I, IRA is and a 401k. What's a 529B, which is a college fund? How do you use a 529B? Uh, what's HSA, FSA, HRA? What are the differences there? It's a bunch of fancy lingo. It's like trainers. They like to use, you know, I R E R. FAI, it's the same thing. It's like as if somebody came into finance and saw and went to a trainer's talk, they would hear a bunch of random acronyms as well. So for me to learn the lingo, personal finance for dummies. And then if you want the best planner for planning out how to pay down debt and to save and to buy a house and all that, the total money makeover by Dave Ramsey. Yes, he has a TV show, which is a little corny, but the book and the plan, a proven plan for financial fitness, it's awesome. So, Richest Man in Babylon, The Millionaire Store, Personal Finance, is Total Money Make It Work. My financial planner, I'm biased, but I probably have been on five, six calls with financial planners over the last five years, and I declined all of them. Noel, is my financial planner now. It took six years to find him. What I like about him is number one, my biggest thing was that you had to show me that you were actually using the products that you're pushing and you had to tell me how much you made and how much you have in your bank account. Because I'm not, I wasn't gonna give my money to anybody. So I wanted to see that he was asked and they, they were completely transparent and showed me everything. Also, he is a gym owner. So he still owns two gyms in Chicago and he does financial stuff for his main job. So what I like is he understands fitness and what we do. So that was a big thing too. So I told him that I'm going to put his name in here with his email. You can email him and tell him I sent you. I personally wouldn't email him unless 
you've probably read a few of these books and you really know what you're looking for. So thank you. If you want these slides, go to Brendan Rear. I'm gonna show everybody through the spreadsheets in a second here. This is my personal website. You can find everything on there. All this stuff down here, the book, checklist, blah, 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 that's all on my personal website. This is my email. If you want these slides, email me and I can get them to you. Now, let's go to the spreadsheet. Okay, now what's cool about this spreadsheet? So I have my budget totals, my total expenses. You're gonna have to find out what your income is for the month and then how much you contribute to your 401k. So if I do five, six, 10, uh, 20, I'm just putting in random numbers here. It's going to calculate all down here. So what you spent on your house, what you spent on your utilities, what you spent on insurance, you can see it calculated it all for me. So I've got all these calculations in here for you. Other membership, then it calculates your total expenses for the month. Income for the month, you have to manually put in. Now you can have another page or over here of all the income that you make. I do that myself. I put all the income in a spreadsheet and you can transfer it over here. And then what do you put in your 401k or your retirement accounts? And then it will spit out what your savings are. And it might be minus. Okay. February, March. Okay, so we have every single month. Now, if you go all the way to the end here, you have your final year total. Now, this is all connected to those first spreadsheets. So you don't have to do anything here other than look at it. So <coughs> you can see where in January I added all those numbers. They calculate right here. Here we are. And then over here, it tells you how much you spent on each category. So on my house last year, I spent this much. On my utilities, I spent this much. Put your income each month over here, your 401k over here, and then down here. You got your total expenses, your income for the year, and then what you saved this year. Again, all you have to do, fill out each of these each month. I just go to my credit card bill. I pay everything with one credit card. I go to that credit card bill and I just put everything in here that was on that credit card and my wife does the same she has her own sheet yes we have two separate sheets two separate bank accounts that way we can track all the money and she goes in and she puts <clears throat> all of her numbers in and then it gets all spit out down here spits out here then the only other thing you need to add in <clears throat> other than all this stuff is whoop, your income for the month and your 401k contribution for the month now, just to show you that I ain't bullshitting you here, I will show you <clears throat> mine. I hope you're ready for this. This is where people think I'm a mess. Okay, so kick ass 2020 21, J and B, my wife's name is Jenny, and B expense spreadsheet. <laughs> Okay, so here we go. <clears throat> the stuff in orange is the stuff that's the same every single month. <clears throat> this is what I've bought. This is what she's bought. So you can see it's all put in the categories over here. And then we have uh, expenses, total expenses. I just have mine. She does her own. My total expenses for January were $4,078. I made $6,216. I put $533 in my 401k. So I saved $2,371. Now you can see my 2021 totals, right? At January here. And then over the year, it's gonna budget and tell me how much I spent on each. I have my last three years total here so that I can compare all of those numbers. Um, let me show you a full year. So I got 2020. <clears throat> and yes, these go as far back as 2014. Um, 
here we go. You can see it's the same spreadsheet. I just copy and paste it each year, build off of it. Um, 2020 totals. So budgeting. So for fun, didn't have a lot of fun in 2020. <laughs> you know, we didn't go out to restaurants. We didn't do any of that. So you can see that number is lower, but usually it's a lot. It's about four to 5,000 every year, maybe a little more or less. My insurance was around four grand, the car was 10, our rent or mortgage was 12. Travel, we didn't travel anywhere, so we only spent $400 in travel, usually that number's 12,000. Rain, my daughter, my child support cost 7,000. Groceries, also, I apologize, this stuff's all cut in half. So if we do this <coughs> equals, uh, I'm going to multiply it all by two. So now you can see what the uh, number was uh, between my wife and I. So these were all my cut in half numbers. So what we actually spent for my wife, between my wife and I was 2,700. Our insurance together was 7,800. The car was 20 grand. The mortgage was 25. Travel was around 900. My daughter, actually, that I pay for that myself, so that should only be the same number here 7,000. Everything else is doubled. Our groceries were 12,000. The house stuff, so house stuff was we bought, uh, what did we buy? We put in new windows. No, we did not put in, that was this year. What did we put in? Oh, last year we put up a new uh, fence because our fence blew down. So $4,000 fence. Utilities the solar loan, and then other end membership. Uh, so that's just an example. I keep track of all my taxes here. I keep track of my income here. And then I just use all these numbers to hopefully make better decisions as we move along. And that we, I always live below my means. 